better run, man. Life's a pain, but you got me. Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you. Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of Venom Vlog. And today we're going to talk about two Venom issues. I know we've been going out of order with these, but they kind of make sense in a linear sense. So uh, we're going to discuss issues 24 and 25 after we've already discussed issue 23 and 26 through 28 and issue 29. But it makes sense because where issue 29 ended with a little hint that Eddie was coming in on the time machine, crashing into the garden, we see that payoff in issue 25 here. So I thought it just made sense to do it in this order. And we also do have digital giveaways in this. So I will give out digital codes for both these books and we'll start with, boom, that one right there, issue 24. First person to go to that website, put that code in, you will get a copy of Venom number 24. And then later on in the episode, when we get to issue 25, we'll, you know, we'll give out the code then for issue 25. So without further ado, let's dive into number 24 here, which is called Sea Lot Varia and Die. And this is basically a story where Eddie now, after he's gone through the Bedlam thing and he's trying to get control of it and he's now traveling around with it on, you know, as a side companion uh, because he's like a human symbiote now. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in Venom Comics. So if you're lost, you know, you can check out some of the old issues or you can ask questions down in the comments and I'll do my best to get you up to date because uh, there's a lot. Uh, but so Eddie now is going to see his old friend, Dr. Doom, over in Latveria, which is the country that Dr. Doom is the ruler over or conqueror over or whatever you want to call him. Um, but he, you know, rules over this land and he has Doom bots work in the airport. So he doesn't have like human laborers. You know, everyone is able to live free as long as they worship Dr. Doom and don't say his name in vain and all this stuff. And so he has these Doom bots that are, you know, working security and working at these airlines. Uh, so, yeah, really interesting. And Eddie is showing up to, uh, you know, to... to into the country and to talk to Dr. Doom because they're old friends. You know, they met recently in Lethal Protector number four slash number two. Uh, that was like a flashback storyline that was written to kind of make this, I guess, make more sense. So they were like, hey, look, we need Dr. Doom and Eddie to kind of know each other. So we need another miniseries that takes place in the past uh, so that, you know, this makes more sense. So good on them for pulling that all together at the last minute because that miniseries ended right, you know, right before this series or this issue came out so good timing so we have bedlam here being unleashed by eddie attacking doom bots causing a ruckus causing a mess he was trying to go in low-key uh but then he got spotted by the doom bots they recognized didn't really recognize him fully but they recognized he had something on him that wasn't human and that's where bedlam came out and just starts eating these doom bots and of course doom bots aren't allowed to fail they're just like dr doom they cannot fail so as he's tearing through them and escapes the you know airport dr doom questions his security and is like all right so you let this human get away he's like well you failed so doom bots don't fail so since you failed boom his head explodes the doom bots head explodes and he was the head of security at the airport and now dr doom will build another robot most likely and uh try to do one you know build one a little bit better so uh so yeah so eddie comes crashing through his bedlam into doom's sanctum and they start talking and they even have a friendly dinner <laughs> and i like the banter here i think what al ewing does really well in this issue is the banter with doom i love doom he's my favorite villain of all time in comic books and so when people write him really well i appreciate it and i think al ewing writes a really really good doom i also liked christopher cantwell's dr doom story that he did where it was like kang the conqueror in doom like talking to each other and kind of being friends and frenemies basically that does play out more here under the pen of Al Ewing, and I think he does a good job. I think Al kills it. And uh, Sergio Davila is the artist on this issue, and I think Sergio kills it and draws an awesome Doctor Doom. Very cool stuff. So, yeah, so him and Eddie are having dinner, and, you know, he's trying to be pleasant. You know, Doctor Doom's like, look, I know that you, last time you came here, you had one symbiote, and I tried to take it off you, and now you have a, you know, you're the master of all symbiotes, and I kind of want to take it off you, but I didn't have a good experience last time, so... I'm willing to play this out. Let's see where this goes. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, you know, they're having like this funny banter. And uh, Eddie's like, yeah, well, I want to borrow your time machine. That's why I came here. He's like, because I can time travel in my mind and I can go to different points of my body throughout time, like the butterfly effect movie kind of. He goes, but I can't actually physically go somewhere. So if I, I feel like if I can physically time travel, I'll screw up this cycle in a way. I want to bring chaos to Meridius's plan. And so, uh, you know, assuming that Meridius hasn't already planned all this out uh, or doesn't know this is already going to happen. So he's like, let me just borrow your time machine. <laughs> and and Doom's response is really funny. He's like, uh, yeah, uh, we don't let kids 
operate guns here in Latveria, <laughs> using that as a metaphor. And he's like, and your understanding of time machine is like a child's understanding of an easy bake oven where they think that's cooking. And he's like, and you think you know time travel and you don't. You're just doing this inner body time travel thing. And he's like, and that's not how time travel really works. Trust me, I know I'm Dr. Doom. I've done a lot. And uh, and I love just like that dismissiveness. Like, he's just like, you're so beneath me. Why am I talking to this guy? And then, you know, he pulls out Bedlam and they fight and he re he's reminded, okay, okay, okay. This guy can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me for a little bit at least. So let's hear him out. And so I like that. And Doom does try to do physical stuff. He summons the, the hand of Azazoth or whatever from the depths of hell coming up to grab, uh, you know, grab Eddie. But then Eddie turns into Bedlam and breaks all of its fingers and gets away. So Doom's like, okay, all right. So this is not going to work. But Eddie at that point is already like, look, I, I'm, I've already located your time machine. I know where it is in here. So he beelines to it. Doom tries to stop him. And when Eddie gets there, he can't figure out how it operates, obviously. And Doom's like, yeah, see, I knew you couldn't turn this thing on. So Eddie just punches it <laughs> and it breaks the machine and it causes it goes all, you know, timey wimey and uh, and sucks them both back through time. Where to? We'll find out in the next issue, which is boom right here. There's the digital code. Put that code in and you'll get it. So now Eddie and Doom are traveling through time in issue 25 here. The Butterfly Collectors is what they call it. And it's written by Al Ewing again, obviously. But there's so many artists on this. You have Sergio Davila. Sean Parsons, Ken Lashley, Cafu, and Julius Ota, who all have been working on the book recently. And they do a great job. And it's pretty seamless. Even though all their art styles are different, there's a seamless feel to the book. And whenever they switch to a new timeline or something, uh, they switch artists then so it doesn't feel as disruptive, which I really dig. I think that looks, it makes the book seem very consistent uh, from a visual standpoint, even though artists are changing. Um, but story-wise, it makes sense for them to change. So yeah, well done on that. Um, but they start off with this Ray Bradbury quote where they're talking about the butterfly effect and where that term comes from and how there was a story Ray Bradbury wrote called The Sound of Thunder that deals with time travel and someone going back in time on a safari to destroy or kill a dinosaur and capture it and bring it back to the present and steps on one butterfly and ruins everything. And obviously there was a great Simpson episode that did something like that in Treehouse of Horrors. And, uh, and that's always been the theory. If you crush one butterfly before it was meant to die, you could unravel all of humanity or whatever. But Dr. Doom says, no, that's not the case. Uh, when you go back in time, if you're doing a couple little things or you know, m seemingly insignificant things, chances are you won't upset time because then time will just fix itself. So you'll go back and change something and then time will go, okay, well then that's always how, how it's been. And, and that's how time keeps a linear fashion i guess in the marvel universe and and so doom is explaining that as he's narrating so he's telling eddie like you know as they wake up in this you know wreckage of this ship he's like look the the time travel machine is going to rebuild itself he's and it's one of those like discs you know the squares that reed richard uses and stuff so he's like look it's going to rebuild itself so while while it's rebuilding let's talk um you know what you're doing is is not time travel and if you come back here and step on one butterfly you're actually not changing anything. You got to step on a lot of butterflies to change something. And he's like, but that's what you don't understand, Edward, because you're just a simpleton, <laughs> you know, and uh, with this giant powerful creature on you. And he's like, but like me, you're a king now and you earned it. You didn't like, it wasn't handed to you or anything like that. You went through a horrible life and then you found a way to take down a God and you took his crown and I applaud you for that. And that's the only reason why you're kind of still breathing and why I'm even entertaining this conversation other than trying to figure out how to cage bedlam and, and and deal with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, because eddie himself as a symbiote is powerful enough but then having bedlam with them is is tough for doom so and and bedlam's a wild card so doom's kind of like let's just you're a king i'm a king let's talk again and uh, of course that doesn't go too well because this symbiote shows up a symbiote t-rex so for a minute here i thought wow they actually didn't go back to the prehistoric age they went to another timeline and i thought they went to the old man logan wastelands where there was a T-Rex Venom. But it turns out that's not the case. He is actually, you know, going through time. And like I said, Meridius is predicting or knows that a lot of this is happening. So as Doom and Eddie wrap things up and wrap their conversation up and leave and get back in their time machine and go to another point in time, that's when the T-Rex symbiote turns into Meridius and kind of reveals, okay, look, like I know from this moment where you got on this machine, you went back in time somewhere and I knew you were going to interact with the T-Rex, so I came back to be the T-Rex. So Meridius is showing exactly how, what Doom's theory is, or what he says is time travel, where Meridius can go back and be the thing Eddie interacted with. Um, so I thought that was kind of neat, and it's it's kind of keeping everything to where you can still follow it, and it's it's not too chaotic. 
But this is where it gets a little chaotic. And so I'd love to hear your opinion on this because I'm going to give you mine and it, it, I don't know if it'll line up with yours, but you let me know. But in 1942 is the next time period they go to. They get a switch in art style and we get to meet again Flexo. Uh, Flexo the rubber man who has now been revealed to be a symbiote of some kind or breeded together with a symbiote and robotics and stuff. If you remember a couple issues ago, the handlers of Flexo sent him on a mission to kill Hitler and he had to pass through this village to get there to where his destination was where he would kill Hitler. And then when we saw him at the end of that and like a Dr. Doom showed up and everything. So like he, when he was there by himself though, there was a bunch of destroyed and you know tanks and military gear and weapons and also a bunch of dead Nazi soldiers. And so Flexo was just standing there looking up at a bird, just admiring it. And he never completed his mission of killing you know Hitler. So, uh, and obviously in the Marvel Universe, that happened differently. There was already a storyline that they've put in Marvel continuity of how Hitler, you know, was taken down. And it's very much like in real life. So um, even though like Captain America fought him and everything like that, they kind of turned that more toward Red Skull and did a Red Skull thing. Uh, but Hitler, as far as I know, in Marvel Comics was taken out similarly as he was in our world too. So for this, you know, it makes sense that Flexo didn't accomplish that mission. So what we have now is we have Eddie and Doom showing up in this timeline and uh, or at this point in time. It's not even a timeline. They're still in the Marvel Universe. And Doom is the one who destroys all the tanks and the gear and the Nazi soldiers. And he's like, you know what? This was always meant to happen. Like this battle was probably always meant to happen. If it wasn't, something would stop me. So he's just like, uh, so I'm going to take pleasure in destroying all these soldiers who work for this horrible, horrible man. Um, so he's going around destroying everything, and Flexo's kind of like just standing there like, what am I supposed to do? But that's when Eddie reaches out to him through the hive psychically and, and notices, hey, you're kind of a symbiote, so I need your help. While Doom is out there doing all this, I need you to come into this building, and I need you to protect these people, you know, that whether that are downstairs, you know, so come down here and uh, and protect them for me, and, uh, and we'll wait till Doom passes, and then you can lead these people out to safety. And then while they go down there, he goes into Flexo's mind, and Eddie sees... A memory of Flexo and that he was sent on a mission to kill Hitler. So now Eddie thinks because he summoned Flexo through the hive and brought him down to this building that he prevented Flexo from actually accomplishing his mission, which I guess he kind of did, um, but that is how time is supposed to work. So this Flexo was not supposed to be the one to take out Hitler already in the timeline. That story was already proven that that wasn't going to be the outcome through older Marvel comics, Golden Age and Silver Age, and then also in this timeline too, in this comic book series, where we saw Flexo just staring at a bird and he never completed his mission. So it doesn't matter that Eddie was the one who called him. It looks like Flexo was going to get distracted by a bird anyway. So uh, so that didn't really work out. But he did get to meet Eddie and now he knows of Eddie's existence and knows him by the name Eddie. Uh, and so Doom, after he wipes out all these soldiers, then once again has a fight with Eddie and then they once again start to talk. And Eddie's trying to tell him, like, look, man, we just screwed something up. Hitler was supposed to die here. But Eddie doesn't really know probably the true story or the full story of, of that. Even though he's a journalist, I feel like he probably would know that story. Uh, but he thinks he stopped the top secret mission that was going to kill Hitler. But it turns out that's not true because we already learned in the comics that that wasn't going to happen through Flexo anyway. So Flexo ends by just staring at the bird that we saw him staring at in the previous issue. So they're doing a really good job of throwing these events in there. Al's doing a good job of pay, trying to pay attention to the details and, and tell this story to where it's it's not disrupting the timeline uh, per se until we get to the end. And there's a reason for that and Kang's going to explain it. So before we get there though, there's this last moment here, which I don't know if I'm a huge fan of. If you are, let me know down below. But uh, this is where Doom gets sent back to talk to younger Doom. And because, you know, when Eddie was trying to tell him about the Hitler thing and that Hitler was supposed to die here um, on this mission. Doom wasn't listening. He's like, no, this is how it was supposed to play out. He's trying to explain it to Eddie. So Eddie punches the machine again and they both get thrown through time again. Um, and then they wake up on different sides of the world. So you have Doom in Latveria talking to a younger version of himself. And then you have Eddie going back and meeting a young Peter Parker, one who just lost his uncle not too long ago and has not met Eddie Brock yet. Doesn't know who Eddie Brock is. And so the two of them are talking and Eddie's got the spider venom symbol on his back. So now you could probably say that because Peter saw that symbol on the, his jacket, it sat in his head somewhere. And when him and the costume bonded on Battleworld, you know, during Secret Wars, that maybe that came out. That the symbiote remembered this encounter on some 
maybe level, possibly, uh, but pulled that memory out of Peter's mind to create that symbol. Even though that symbol, I think, was already on Spider-Woman or something. So who knows? I mean, it kind of messes with things there, but it doesn't matter. They have a good heart-to-heart -heart conversation here, I guess. And, um, and I think that was the whole point of this scene was that Eddie is trying to tell Peter, like, I'm trying to be more like you. But he's saying Parker... And Peter thinks he's talking about Uncle Ben. So he's like, oh, you knew my Uncle Ben? And, and he's like, yeah, okay, let's, for the sake of this, you know, let's just say, so I don't screw things up even more. Let's just say, yeah, okay, I knew your Uncle Ben. And I wanted to be more like him because he taught about responsibility. And every time I do something, I think, what would Parker do? What would Parker do in this situation? And then Spider-Man, or Peter, says like, all right, cool, you stay here. Don't eat anyone's brains, because Eddie mentions that he ate brains before, and Peter's a little freaked out by that, and he's like, look, I'm going to go and find someone to help you, and uh, and he'll swing by here soon enough, so just hang out for a minute. And so Peter runs off, and Eddie's like, yeah, okay, sure, now I'm going to meet Spider-Man. Uh, but Doom at this point has already you know, knocked out younger Doom uh, with his powers, and he revealed his true face, and he's like, hey, have you... You haven't even seen this face. Your face is still scarred up and everything. You haven't learned how to heal this. Uh, you haven't even gone to hell to save your mother. So what, you know, what chance do you have of defeating me, an older version of yourself? So he knocks Doom out. I think, I don't know if he erases his memories or not of the event. Uh, but then he gets back on the time machine. It rebuilds and he goes and gets Eddie. And the two of them go to the one place that make the most sense for Doom to take Eddie, which is he's bringing him to the future to meet his best friend, Kang the Conqueror. And that's where they go. And this book, it's a thick book. So there's a lot. There's still more pages left to discuss. But when they're talking to Kang, you know, he decides to make some chrono clones, you know, like versions of himself from alternate realities that are that make different decisions. And he brings them all to his reality to fight Venom slash Bedlam and also Dr. Doom. They all three get killed. And Kang's like, yeah, that's fine. That's OK. They got killed because now those three realities I can go conquer now. I just created three realities to go conquer. And they decide, OK, well, let, let's put our crap aside Eddie here, a friend of mine, you know, he's, this is not the Eddie I know because we're at, way at the end of time and stuff. He's like, so this is the king that's already been betrayed by Meridius. So he's kind of like, all right, I think. And so, so correct me if I'm wrong there, but he's like, yeah, I've already met Tiro. He's changing to Meridius, that kind of thing. Like he's, he's like, I've already met a version of Eddie and me and him were pals. Uh, but you know, me and other versions of Eddie are not pals. And so me and this Bedlam version are not pals, but you know what? You know, just because there's a part of you that ended up in the friend I made, I'm going to help you out. And he goes, uh, so here's Rosebud 2. It's an old time machine that Reed Richards built, which Doom makes a comment about, a funny comment. He says, God, why, Reed, do you always have to build time machines to look like family vehicles or minivans <laughs> or something like that? And it's, it's. I was like, yeah, okay, cool, that's cool. Just another dig at Reed Richards. Just how much hatred Doom has for Reed is so great. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so he's like, all right, you can have Rosebud 2 and you can take it. And it'll bring you into the garden where Meridius exists and you can fight. He goes, but I need a favor from you. And Eddie's like, dude, you just created three chrono clones and we killed them. And now you have three new worlds to conquer. What other presents can I give you? And he's like, like whatever, what else do you need from me? And he's like, just give me a sample of Bedlam. That's all I need. He goes, it's important and it has to be because of the timeline. So you, you, one way or another, you, I'm going to get this sample. So just give it to me. So Eddie's like, fine. And he puts the little sample in the jar He's like, you can have that version of a Bedlam. It's just a little sliver. It's not much. And he's like, and I'm going to get in this time machine and I'm going to go crash the party at the garden. And that's when Kang the Conqueror reveals, because Doom's like, why? You have all this whole army of symbiotes that Meridius gave you and everything. He's like, why do you need this you know, sliver of this Bedlam symbiote? And he goes, oh, because this thing is very special in time and it's going to play a factor in something big hap happening that's coming up uh, or that has already happened, but will come up in Eddie's timeline. And he's like, isn't that right, you little rascal, you? So, yeah, Kang reveals that that little sliver that he jarred up actually is the thing that gets bonded to, I think, the Carnage sliver and becomes Red Goblin. Uh, so really unique, really cool uh, that they tied that up. And also makes me wonder what role Red Goblin's going to play in the coming Venom War and, you know, everything that's coming up for Venom World and stuff. So now, at the end of issue 29, we saw Eddie coming in on Rosebud 2, ready to crash it into Meridius. Well, we're going to see that here, because here's the fight we've seen before, where Bedlam gets big and he separates Eddie from, you know, one of the other versions of Eddie, um, you know, so or Finnegan or whoever, and he's, like, separating them, pulling them apart. So... That all, all happened the way we saw it happen in earlier comics, except now, boom, 
we have the shuttle crashing, uh, Rosebud 2, and it crashes right into Meridius and, and turns him into goo. Of course, he's not dead, probably, but it takes him out of the picture for a second so that Eddie can get up as Bedlam, as a, another Bedlam, uh, one that has a slightly different costume, a different look to him than that one, and he's ready to fight uh, these other Eddies. And so he has now gone out of the timeline or cage, and it's explained here uh, very extensively by Kang the Conqueror when Doom is like, why did you do that? Why did you let him go so easily? And he's like, because Eddie has been traveling through time in his mind. And because of that, he's not really disrupting anything. So everything that's about to happen is going to happen because it's just his mind going through time and it's not like him physically moving through it, right? So it, it has its own rules when you travel just that way. Um, it does follow the greater rules, but it has its own rules too. And so it kind of creates a squiggly line, right? Where it just keeps going in on itself and, and it oversex at times and everything. So he's just drawing a squiggly line being like, this is the timeline that Eddie is created for himself from Eddie to Meridius. Um, but now that he's physically moving through time, he is now another element, right? And so he draws another arrow and another set of arrows. And he's like, and now Eddie is something else outside of that timeline moving through it, which now that garden that Meridius created, at one point it was at the end of time, right? We saw that in issue 29, where at the end he went into the hive, took it over, turned it in the garden, and then moved the garden into like another realm, essentially another reality. And that trapped it there, kind of freeing it from the cage of time, or so Meridius thought. Um, and so that's when Kang says, yeah, so all we needed was an, a wild card to bring it back into a timeline. And so now that Eddie is physically moving, he has now constricted the garden to the rules again of one reality and, and one timeline, um, but being a wild card in it. So he's kind of brought chaos and screwed everything up. And Doom is not impressed by this explanation. He's like, yeah, okay, so it's the laws of time and it's blah, blah, blah. He's like, this is nothing. He's like, you know what sucks about all this, Kang, is that you're not teaching me anything new. And I know you really want to. I know you want to be the genius in the room because, you know, part of you doesn't want this and part of you does. You want to evolve into your older, wiser version of yourself called Immortus, who actually is a threat to a lot of people. And you're just little old Kang the Conqueror, still trying to wear the big boy pants. And he's just talking down to him and it pisses Kang off. But, you know, as he blasts Dr. Doom to try to, you know, kill him or get him out of there, Doom enters the time stream again and gets his, you know, machine. The square has rebuilt itself and he takes it back to uh, the present day, a little bit past the present day, which I'm sure they're going to have to fix at some point because this is 2023 on top of the building. And it's he says he shows up during the Venom War and there's a bunch of symbiotes down in New York fighting each other again, <laughs> just like King and Black, just like a lot of Venom stories. And so he realizes, though, that in this moment, in this war down there, this is the moment that will define, you know, this is where Eddie will, uh, you know, separate, you know, or he has two paths he could choose. This could be the path where he saves the world again and, and everything works out or the path where he destroys himself once and for all. And Doom is kind of like, wouldn't it be interesting if he's not the one who chooses that decision for him? So he decides to go back in time again and talk to Flexo, which is an image we saw in a previous issue. After Flexo was staring at the bird and didn't complete his mission, he looked up and heard a familiar voice. It was Dr. Doom. And Dr. Doom says, yeah, you know who Eddie is? So in the future, I saw you down there in the Venom War and you, you were there during the big battle. So I'm going to implant something in you to overwrite your programming. So when you get to this pivotal moment in that fight, you're actually going to turn on Eddie as he's fighting his son, Dylan. And then the book ends with that big splash page there where you know, Dylan as Venom is fighting his father and they're getting their rematch like they said they would. And you had Flexo in the background. So... Yeah, they're setting up a lot, obviously, and uh, the time travel stuff, as, as weird and loopy as it can be, and I know some people don't like time travel stuff, I do like time travel stories when they're done well, and I like Kang the Conqueror, and I love Doctor Doom, so having them be a part of this, I'm like, yeah, okay, I, I like them as, as like, uh, explainers of this, you know, this, the way time travel works in the Marvel Universe, and then Eddie, being like most fans who are probably reading the book, 
who are kind of layman's at time travel and think, oh, well, I'm going off of Back to the Future or even the Avengers Endgame movie or whatever. Like you have your own version of what you think time travel is. This book did a good job explaining how the time travel works in Marvel Comics, or at least through the eyes of Al Ewing, I guess. Uh, you know, I guess every writer could be different. So, but it made sense. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay, this is this works and, and I'm digging this. And I like that it was Kang and Doom talking about it and it was a good way to get exposition while these two guys are trying to outsmart and belittle each other and be really derogative towards each other i think that was perfect like it was great tone for those two characters and eddie finally breaking through and getting out of the cage because that's like a theme that obviously that was set up in the donny cates run and ryan segman run where they talked about cages and clintar means cage and even doom in this book references that and says you know they wear their clintars on their back like a cage you know like people like eddie brock and stuff and uh, and eddie is now broken free seemingly like we don't know if this is you know because meridius already predicted the t-rex thing so who knows he probably predicted this too on some level and maybe wanted to be brought back into a singular timeline and didn't know how and just kind of goaded eddie to doing it because maybe meridius has done this a couple hundred times now and is stuck in a loop of the same things happening over and over with no different result and now he's like let's let something else happen let's let chaos happen and it'll get you know eddie or make him think he has the edge over us and then it turns out it's going to be exactly what i had planned for so who knows we don't know exactly the extent of meridius's intelligence it seems like he's very advanced uh to the point where he was able to you know outsmart kang the conqueror to an extent in issue 29 so it'll be interesting to see but for the next few issues like this catches us up completely and overall i like these two issues you know the in the beginning the time travel stuff i was the first like i think like six or seven issues i was like okay this isn't bad and then they cut back and forth between street level and cosmic and i was like okay and then it started to lose me and then dark web was just a nightmare of a story that i didn't like but then it's been regaining and i think through great art like cafu and some of the people working on this book and ken lashley and a lot of great artists on this like i'm being pulled a little bit more back in to where i'm at least not dreading you know doing the reviews because during dark web i mean it started to feel like homework like not good homework you know and uh, and so for me like i was burning out a little bit because of that but this pulls me in a little bit more and it's got me a little intrigued and uh like i said i wish they didn't breeze over the kang friendship thing but it looks like we're nearing probably the last year or so of this run i'm assuming because we have a carnage we have a couple more issues between now and the carnage crossover starting but the Carnage crossover will be a Dylan street level story, as far as I know, where it's Dylan Venom versus Carnage for the first time. And then who knows where that story will end. It'll go through both books, Venom and Carnage. And then at the end of that, they'll probably set up Venom World or Venom War or whatever they're building up towards here. And that might go into, you know, the issue early 40s. Who knows, maybe this book will even last 50 issues. Like, I think Immortal Hulk ran almost that long, and Donny Cates' run ran between 40 and 50 issues. So that just seems like the ballpark where a lot of these guys write. And since this book is selling pretty good, but it's not no longer the top-selling Marvel book by far uh, anymore. So I imagine they'll probably want to switch it up and, and switch writers out at, at some point, you know, after the next movie comes out. So this could be the last, like, 15 or so issues of or more, you know, maybe a little bit more, of, uh, of, of Al Ewing's run. So we'll cover them, but we'll wait until the trades come out. So I won't be covering individual issues anymore. If the next few issues leading up to the Carnage story, when they come out, when they go on sale on Comixology, I'll buy them and we'll do a group episode of those three issues or four issues, however many it is. Then when the Carnage story goes on Comixology, I'll buy them when they go on sale and we'll talk about that crossover. And then every story after that will go by trade paperback until the run ends. Um, and then this will probably be the last run of Venom we talk about on the show in current continuity because at that point we'll be nearing you know issue uh, episode 1000 and we'll be have talked about the third movie. It'll probably have released by then and everything and out on Blu-ray. So we'll be wrapping up the show at that point. So yeah, uh, so that's, for that reason, I'm going to stick it with it and see how it ends, but I'm only going to do it through trades. I know that might disappoint some of you, but I, I apologize. It's just I get burnt out on some of this stuff, and there's still some past stories we got to cover that, are, to me, are just as important. So I want to go back and get those done and some of those what ifs and some of that you know, other reality stuff. Um, I want to talk about Mayday Parker and her world and how she interacted with the symbiotes. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff we still have to cover that we haven't done so on the show yet, and I want to get that done before we get to episode 1000, and obviously we're going to have movie news and stuff coming out, and as marketing ramps up and merchandise comes out and all that, we'll have a lot of those episodes eating up those last 140 episodes. So we got to, you know, I got to be careful of how many comics I cover, and so the new ones we're just going to reduce to trade paperbacks, and I hope that's okay with you guys, because 
that's unfortunately what I got to do for now. Uh, so thank you so much. Let me know what you think of these two issues, though, down in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I hope you enjoyed. You know, if you got the digital copies, if you won them, let us know down in the comments uh, what your favorite issue was, if you liked them both, what you liked, didn't like, whatever it is. Let me hear your reviews down below of those digital copies if you won them. Um, and if you didn't win them and if you just bought these books on your own, let me know your reviews down below as well, and we'll keep talking down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And hopefully tomorrow night or whenever this airs, the next day or the day after, soon after this, Seek at Night will finally start. So please check that out. If you want to see me talk about other characters other than Venom, we're going to talk about Blade, Moon Knight, Ghost Rider. It might be Pepper in some Daredevil and Punisher throughout that story. You never know, or that, that series. You never know. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff, uh, but it'll be a different setup, two cameras, you know, different kind of editing style. So hopefully you guys like it, and, uh, and that'll be going up soon. So stay subscribed so you don't miss out on that too. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.